this is uh, this uh, research is cooperation with Hiroki Satake and Michiko Hamada. Um, you can find their work in the exhibition. <coughs> Maybe you can have a look later. So the title is Mokanga Horik. <laughs> I know you are also crazy about Mokanga, so that's why you are here. <laughs> This is a research for the people who make mokanga in culture center and private art club. My interest is why Japanese people have been making mokanga more than other countries. In the last international mokanga conference, I did the presentation about mokanga in art class in elementary school and junior high school. Japanese people should have an experience of mokanga and making mokanga in the childhood. That's why everyone knows mokanga even it is such a negative memory, like cutting the finger. <laughs> On the other hand, Mokanga is pretty popular with retired people as a hobby. Sometimes they are absorbed in Mokanga. In this, in this my research, I would like to repeat why Mokanga attracts them. His name is Shigeo Mohara, 68 years at all, maybe no one knows. <laughs> when, he, when he retired from the drug company at the, the age of 60, he began to run Mokhanga in Citizen College in Sagamihara City. The Citizen College is for the people over 60s who lived in Sagamihara City. He took a class for one year and ran Mokhanga and uh, the printmaker, Hiroko Furuta. He, she is a uh, head professor of the Tamai Art University now. He has made New Year's card in, in Mokhanga, but he hasn't made large-scale Mokhanga before. <coughs> this is the latest on his Mokhanga. Six, six good blocks with eight colors and over 10, over ten passes. <laughs> The size of the work is, is about like 45 centimeters by 30 meters. He spent two months for carving wood blocks and two weeks for printing. He woke up at six in the morning, like every day, and worked for three hours, like every day. This is the detail. The space where he used mock hunger has no air conditioning. So getting too hot in the summertime. So that's why he had to walk up such a high time. He loves to he loves go to um, antique market to buy all the stuff. Most of the carving knives are from the market. Also he makes knives by himself using the piece of a spring crock. These are knives he made. He used grinder for shopping. These are also from the market he found. Maybe one printmaker used, used them before. And also he made stone strips for the sharpening, sharpening backside of knife. He used the bearing barren. Now he is really interested in making barren as well. Maybe he is really interested in, interested in a class of making barren of, by the Kotosan. <laughs> this is also his mock hunger. He made in October 16, so last year. Yeah, 2016. <laughs> he made many prints for finalizing, finalizing his mock hunger. He keeps carving and printing many times. Also trying new materials. He used some different type of inks and such as dry pigment, pigment paste, powder pigments, student paint as well. He is very passionate about challenging new materials, tools and techniques. This is his ongoing mokanga. He has been working with this work for five months now, but he's not satisfied yet, especially the crowd and the reflection. He, he talked 
uh, he need to carve some more that part. Actually, he he only has eight years experience of the mokanga, but his technique is his technique and the knowledge of the mokanga is very high. He he attended two mokanga classes and the pottery class. He also loves traveling. <coughs> His work from photographs <coughs> he took during traveling. He's a very serious and hand, a right-handed person. But he's a really typical type of person who attends the Mokanga class in Japan. This is a list of Mokanga class, or uh, <laughs> private Mokanga club in Japan. Top is Hokkaido. Hokkaido, Aomori, Iwate, Fukushima, Ibaraki, Tochigi, Chiba. Next page. Saitama Prefecture. Then the green is Tokyo. So, so basically, there's, uh, so in the list, there are like over 20, 200 Mokanga clubs in Japan. Basically, there are three different types. Wine smoke hunger class organized by major newspaper companies, such as uh, also the TV companies, such as NHK or Asahi or Yomiuri or Mainichi. They are called culture center. For example, NHK culture center, Asahi culture center, Mainichi culture center. Culture center is a Japanese English. It means like, like adult education class or lifelong education program. Anyone can take a class which you would like to run, but <coughs> most of them are housewives or retired people. Continuing, continuing. <laughs> so over like 200 Mahanga art clubs. <coughs> then, this is a leaflet NHK Culture Center in Hachori City. They have like 258 different courses covering all categories like such as literature, language course, calligraphy, photography, painting, pottery, cooking, piano, guitar, flower arrangement, pura dance, <laughs> and Japanese dance, and yoga, like everything. So Mokanga is one of the courses. Like Normally they have a class once a week or twice a month, and depends on the course. Each course lasts six months, like half a year. People need to register and pay the course fee. It is depends on the course, but if you take the class once a week, they will charge about like 200 US dollars. And also they charge a registered fee, $50. But if you are over 70, it will be free. <laughs> Japanese people are very serious about filling a time with plans, especially the housewives who have completed their child raising roles, or retired people who have no particular hobbies. I visited eight different private Mokan clubs and culture centers in Tokyo and Kanagawa and Hyogo, it is the west side of Japan. This is the private Mokan clubs. It's called Mokuhan 23, 23 <coughs> in Sagamihara City, which Mr. Mohara belongs in. They have 30 members in total. 70% of them are men and men. They have a class twice a month, start at 9 to 12 o'clock. The membership fee is just 20 US dollars a month. They, they are funded in two, two, 20, 2012 by five original members, and then they had to find teachers by, by themselves. She's a Michiko Hamada. You know, the, he, her work was uh, our date. She's about mm, nearly 30. So this is the Mokanga artist Michiko Hamada. He's a teacher of the Mokanga club, the young female teacher 
is very popular with many members. <laughs> Always very popular. <laughs> She's a graduate of the Tama Art University, which has fervor for Mokanga education. His Mokanga career is 80 years. It's also what is also very nice. Actually, their technique of carving and printing is very high. He has also been making Mokanga for 10 years. He is uh, 80 years old now. He makes beautiful Mokanga. He also makes own carving knives by himself. He used to work as an engineer. Once a year, they have an exhibition in the city hall. So they are very happy to show their works to the people outside of Mokanga Club. They only showed works never sold. Yeah. Because if one of the members was successful, the friendship with members will sour. <laughs> <laughs> never <laughs> sold works. <laughs> So show, just showing the works is their pleasure. So very photographic. Good work. Making black and white. This is another another private um, Mokan club in Ayase City. They have eight members at the moment. Name is Arai. Mr. Arai is head of the, this um, Mokanga club. He's 85 years old, but he still has a passion for Mokanga and making new Mokanga. His Mokanga career is 20 years, it's more than me. This is the work, new series of work, which are based on the map of Japan. Mrs. Shimizu makes beautiful landscape and flower mokanga. Like this. He makes carving knife by himself again. He only uses hangito. He makes this one with only, only the hangito. He carved letters, every letters, and of half sutra and printed. He recently used the laser cutter for his mokanga. <coughs> he likes a new technique and his, he makes very challenging works. He used to work works at a um, construction company. You can find his work in the exhibition as well. I'm really surprised he um, submitted the, the work in the, the company. Like this work, laser cutter. <coughs> this Mokanga is also using the laser cutter because he tried to um, make the, his drawing lines, but he has no um, techniques for carving like like drawing lines by hand. So <coughs> he used laser cutter for that. <coughs> He has also a big passion for mo making mock hunger. Please have a look this one. This is the upro. This is the print. So he cut each figure of crane by hand because he thought it was more flexible to think uh, the composition and also unnecessary ink does not stick on the to stick to the paper. So this is the So in the survey... Can you go back two yes. slides? Yeah, which... Are we looking at a print? This is the block. This is the print. I don't understand. Actually, he paint each print. Oh, this is... By hand? <coughs> I see. Thank you. I think I see. 
So actually, I interviewed like over 100 people who are attending the Mokawa um, clubs and the culture centers. But I've got um, totally 70, 79 um, questionnaires. About 70% of people are men. The average age of the members are 70 years old. There are two people who are over 90 years old. Many more can class at minimum age of uh, requirement of 60 years old. It is the age of retirement from the company, so that's why they, they decided 60. So this is the time to start something to do for happy and productive life after, after the retirement. So in the survey, I, I gave the, the question. I asked them to answer eight questions. My first question is, how long have you been taking Mokan class? More than 10 years. I talk five to less than 10 years. Most of them have over one year Mokan experience. Many male members have started it at the age of 60. There are two people who have been making Mokanga for 20 years, over 20 years. So have you ever made Mokanga before taking class? Like expect at class, uh, at schools. So 52% of them answered yes. Most of them have made a New Year's class <coughs> Mokanga for a long time. So what triggered you started Mokanga? So many people studied to Mokanga in an adult education class or like like lifelong education <coughs> program when they retired. Also they are still keen on making New Year's card by Mokanga, even it is getting like old fashioned culture. What is your favorite thing and what is fun making Mokanga? Half of them no. Half of them answered they like carving and printing process. Especially the carving. They really like. Do you make Mokanga even outside the class? Eighty four percent of people said yes at home. They like making mokanga at home, not in the not only in the class, because in the class they want to ask questions or advices to teacher or friend. So mokanga club is like a social community place to communicate with other people. How many hours a day do you make mokanga? So half of them make mokanga for like one, two, three hours a day. They are busy for other hobbies, actually. They also taking care, <coughs> taking care of grandchildren, and also they, go, they should go to hospital as well. Even though they will find the time to make mokanga. What are you doing to improve your mokanga skills? So they are very serious about improving their skills. So they listen to teachers or friends' advices really carefully. And also going to the exhibition to see others' works. Also trying to different materials, color inks, and techniques, and reading the book, reading a book. And what, this is the last question. What is the fascination of Mokanga for you? They are fascinated in the process of the Mokanga. Most of the men who attend Mokanga club, they worked really hard in the company for a long time before. They are not good at painting freely. So they prefer to follow arrows and they like to learn how to make Mokanga step by step. Also, they have a lot of free time and abundant money to buy materials and papers as well. 
So in this, in this research, I could know how much they seriously work on Mokanga. And also, I was so surprised their skill and knowledge is really high. However, they are like outside, outside the artists, because most of them didn't study art in the college or universities. So they have studied to Mokanga when they are retired or children and left, uh, left from home. But their career is not that <coughs> short, actually. More than 10 years is an exceptional. There are people who are doing more than 20 years. It is longer than my career. They are kind of a high-skilled amateur artist. And they are pure and serious about making more country. So their main purpose is how to enrich the rest of their life. Selling artworks or being a famous artist <coughs> is not their intention. So even though we can ignore them, and we cannot ignore them and their Mokanga works, the shops are gained by their shopping. Also, Mokanga artists are gained by working as a teacher. But, but, num but number of population who attend the Mokanga class is decreasing because of aging. <laughs> in the last conference, I did a presentation about Mokama in art class in elementary schools and junior high schools. I also explained, the, explained about teaching guidelines, but recently changed. Children, children doesn't, doesn't have to make don't have to make mukanga in a school anymore. Whether student make mukanga or not, it really depends on the teacher, art teacher. So in conclusion, the future of mukanga in Japan is not bright. Declining birth rate and aging society will have a major impact on mukanga. I think we have to see their work and evaluate them properly because private Mokanga clubs have contributed greatly to popularization, popularization of Mokanga <coughs> in Japan. Thank you. <laughs>
I also like, as I explained, they really like um, hand works. Uh -huh. Also process. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's really related to the man's like work. <laughs> In from the left, is that Maki Sai? Yes. <laughs> Maki Sai is a very good teacher. Yeah, he's well, a brilliant artist. Well, yeah. uh, and what's that at Tama University? This is the Tama Art University. Yeah. This, this is open campus. So the people who attend the Mokan class, we are going to together to open campus. But open campus is um, normally for the getting new students, so normally for the young, like high school students, to get the uh, art student to go to the Tamari Art University. But they are really serious about the Mokanga, so they are like free uh, trial for making etchings and the Mokanga, so they decided to go together to open campus. So this is like an extension of the Yeah, it's an extension. And all these old people go to the Mokohanga. Yeah. They're not young persons. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
all different sizes off conveyors. And I had learned pretty much how to how to program and how to do electronics. And it was a, that was a cool project, kind of complicated actually. Just this is all just conveyor, but back there you can see was our cool order filling system. Uh, so I was in business only about 15 years, waiting to make enough money to uh, make art again. And really, I talked with my best friend almost every day, and both of us asked, well, how much is enough? How much is enough? So he's still uh, working and uh, doing uh, regular work. And since about 1990, 91, I've been making art again you know, seven days a week full time. So I really in the 90s, I was really interested in uh, uh, surface design tile patterns, uh, tile rotations. Uh, these are some uh, relief prints. They're oily, made from a movable type face where the, each side of a cube was routed out a little differently. They made tons of these cubes yeah. and set them in grids and printed them to communicate image. Uh, and uh, I could talk about just those for a long or like. Uh, these, I made uh, literally hundreds of thousands of simple tile designs uh, during this time. You can see one's automated wiggling there. And again, so this is about, this only goes through the symmetrical arrangements of uh, 16 tiles of a group four on a side with a triangle painted on, on each one. So this one, though, isn't four on a side. This one is uh, uh, three sets of four, I guess, three or four sets. This must, there must be four sets of four tiles in here running through their patterns, some of which are attractive to me and some of which are uh, kind of repulsive. And I, since they're really equivalent, that I had a long period of thinking about aesthetics and uh, what is beauty and why do I find the same, you know, different arrangement of the same stuff appealing and uh, interesting. So these were early, pre, before I had any training uh, uh, Mokuhanga. So this is watercolor brushed on blocks. I didn't know anything about Kento registration. So these were registered with, through pinholes in the blocks and paper. Uh, and uh, another one on the left. On the right is uh, my first multi-block print. I was a student of Hiroki Morinoe in 1996, boy, lucky two week intensive so every day all day carving printing and this is uh, he had a hundred views of Edo by Hiroshige a book of those prints and I was uh, influenced by the weird point of view and uh, you know looking through the horse's legs at town and so on so this was my uh, not Japanese take on Hiroshige color and point of view and so a fisherman and his wife my ex-wife <laughs> with me as my libido pops out to grant my every wish or something <laughs> fishy fishy in the sea uh, so more uh, mokuhanga tilings these are again these are blocks identical blocks with a pattern cut out of them arranged freely i did uh, lots more than i can possibly show of this kind of printing uh, I was commissioned to do, I also make furniture and musical instruments and, uh, and play and uh, other stuff, painting, drawing especially. So this is a room I was commissioned to, to do a meeting room for a bit. <coughs> it also had a big table, six chairs, but I'm showing it because the blocks for some prints I made, these are the prints on the right that, that were hanging on the other side of the room along with the blocks which are much more attractive. I think the prints, which are large, maybe uh, maybe four feet four feet high, mounted as uh, hanging scrolls on, on the fabric. A New Year's card. This was uh, about three inches high uh, from uh, fourteen or fifteen blocks, something like that, with the variations in the printing. I like that third one from the left a little bit. This is a Dojo G Maiden, uh, so she's. There is the maiden under the bell, angry at her priest husband. I think uh, if there was a theme 
there really isn't, but if there was a theme, it might be angry. Angry women. Don't be mad at Another uh, Moku Hanga, this one is, uh, you know, many blocks and uh, the dogs, the ghost dogs flying around in this lightning storm on Micah uh, overlays. I was for a print exchange with Barrett Forum. I was very active, I'm still semi active, but very active uh, with Barrett Forum from uh, late 1990s, <coughs> around 2000, something like that, which is where I met. April and uh, Frank Kriba is here, uh, and a bunch of other people. This was my first uh, Azurie reduction print, so this would, this is a PG Azurie. My, I, I made a whole bunch of prints kind of riffing off traditional Japanese subjects, and uh, that 1830s, 1840s Prussian blue uh, influence in Japanese prints. And you can see the uh, block plan here, are the parts that were to be carved away uh, were uh, probably left white. And after this print, I realized that the addition of black instead of just blue would be helpful. And I reversed my uh, block planning process, so I printed the areas to be carved in black. And I was transferring toner from uh, laser copies onto the blocks using the lacquer thinner which hasn't affected me at all. <laughs> uh, this was a second, a second attempt at uh, Azurie uh, with mother and child. I was interested in it blurring too, so you can see the block and the print. And then uh, the print on the right with a, that uh, oak, the wood grain came from a big open grain block of oak, and uh, this was printed on gumpy, very soft paper. The one on the right was a first shot at color printing. Uh, I worked a little larger, so these are Oban, uh, roughly 10 by 15 inches. This one is a double Oban, about 15 by 20 or so, from a big uh, cherry wood block. That was the block. There's my, you can see I'm a very neat printer, not like a real Mokuhanga printer, but uh, in any case, I'm building this print up. This is uh, approached like a reduction print, so that's the final print. I think there were uh, 17 or 18 states of the block to produce the print, brushed up again in uh, Prussian blue dry pigment uh, rice paste, and I uh, was using Nezumi, a real thick sumi made from old crushed up sumi sticks. Uh, these are the opposite, so these are actually about two inches high and two inches wide that were tiny little mm -hmm. uh, This was in 2003, uh, I hosted the first Baren Forum, kind of like our conference, but we were all printing in my studio. There were 33 of us, and we arranged activities. So the Spencer Museum in Lawrence uh, had a, mounted a show called Inspired by Japan. They showed our prints in the museum, and this is our group. Uh, uh, the group of printers, most of whom just slept in my studio for a week. And you can see April yeah. in the blue dress on the left, and Frank is right behind her, and I'm somewhere in the front of the picture. And the, uh, this was inside the Spencer, looking in prints, and you can see, uh, I think our recent print exchange was, a, was in Hotanzaku size, so you can see that in the lower left, and April and Frank and uh, and the uh, curator of prints at the Spencer. So I was hand carving at this time, and I was mostly doing reduction printing. You can see my one of the hand carved block states on the right, and, and the print with a with about a Suji block uh, Watanabe's prints from the 1920s uh, behind her, and my fabulous model uh, Jessica, who I used a lot. So I had a show, uh, I was offered a show, I visited Kyoto and the gallery owner uh, asked me what I did. I was looking, this was uh, at a, a show of fantastic masterpieces of Japanese prints and I told him that I made Mokuhanga and he said he'd like to see that and he had a computer and I showed him pictures of prints on the website and he said, 
Uh, I don't know what that is, but it's not Mokuhanga. Mokuhanga means woodblock print. And, like, uh, and uh, I felt challenged, and I had brought a bunch of prints with me to show a friend in Tokyo, another printmaker. Uh, and I said, well, I'll bring them in, you can see them. So the next day I brought them in, and he looked at them and offered me a show, maybe out of to make up for for the insults of the day before, I don't know, but it was a, it was very nice. It's a nice gallery, and uh, he said he wanted he didn't like some of my prints. He really liked the nudes. He wanted like you know 20 prints like that. It definitely influenced my direction, and I started making prints for this show. He asked how long it would take. I said maybe a year and a half. So he scheduled the show for October of 2004, and in uh, Early 2004, I had the urge to work larger, and I had all kinds of physical problems from carving and printing. And uh, some, I was using uh, formalin to extend my open time on papers to about five days. That's hot and uh, wet in Kansas City, especially in the summers. And I had developed a kind of weird dermatitis from the formalin, which I thought was from one of the woods I was using. And, I was frustrated and behind, and uh, I thought, well, I can carve by computer-controlled routers. So I bought this machine that you see uh, was less than $5,000, which seemed like a good risk. And uh, you have to put, it comes in a crate. You have to put every nut and bolt in yourself and, and level it. And it took a couple of weeks to put together, and it worked, and it was cool. So these were among the first blocks, this set of uh, 15 blocks uh, for the print that you see superimposed on there, and me looking oh, exhausted after all this carving <laughs> <laughs> that took a day, uh, <laughs> and uh, also thinking, my god, it's amazing. You just draw you draw in, in uh, your computer the area you want to carve, and the and, uh, and tool path it. There's, it's simpler than that. Uh, not, it's more complicated than I'm making it, but bang, uh, there are blocks. So uh, here, maybe, is, uh, is what the control looks like for the machine. I'm right now executing line 148,000, sorry, 14,860 something. I'm carving a dozen blocks for a uh, print exchange, I don't remember what the subject was, something weird. Uh, and uh, so this is clearing the uh, areas around the printing areas that you're all familiar with. After I've completed carving, I'll cut the blocks apart to make the, and I forgot to count, maybe a dozen blocks uh, for this print. And here I'm uh, clearing, this is a quarter inch bit that you see through through the plastic as it as it bites away the non-printing areas around some delicate letters. Enough? That's enough of that. So there's the print, uh, which which sort of uh, moved from pink to green to black as I printed the blocks, uh, and uh, and I'm looking at that, thinking about what I said earlier and wondering, I wonder, do I? Do I really have issues? Maybe I need to go back into one of So, the, so uh, in order to print uh, large prints uh, on the order of tw uh, 24 by 32 inches, uh, I couldn't handle the uh, thin handmade Japanese papers easily uh, to register them without them uh, right out over the block. And I could register the print out of the ink over the block and then let my foot off the pedal and the drawer would withdraw and lay the paper out on the block. And uh, so I could, I could have really tight registration and, and print really easily. The second drawer I opened by hand and that would take up the damn print just printed. And uh, so again, the one on the left is uh, 30 inches roughly high uh, and super dense in the darks. So I like that. Uh, and the one on the right is a uh, is an interesting print. We can talk about how the prints are, how the blocks are planned and other time. So more prints. These were gift prints. Getting ready for the show at Ezoshi in Kyoto, 
I thought I would make, sorry, I thought I would make a, a prince to give his gifts in Japan and the reaction of the people who helped me, who I gave his prince to was uh, often precious. Excuse me, Mike, could you come back one slide? So yeah, I'm going forward to the blocks. I just want to get a shot of that. Yeah, I didn't get there yet. I, I, I got that one by mistake, but those are the blocks to okay. print over. So what is that, 16, 16 blocks for these little prints, which after print, so I printed the three all together on a sheet and cut them apart. And put them in fancy little envelopes. Uh, another uh, sort of double Oban size uh, reduction print. This one actually, in between printings, I actually put the block, registered the block back on the machine and carved some more. And then you can see me at Hizoshi in Kyoto for the opening of this show. Here are other printmakers, mostly uh, some famous and some just regular people. I see a print dealer in there. And I know one of the printers grabbed my hand in this show, one of the professional printers. He looked, actually, I'm left handed, so he looked at my right hand and could see there were no calluses from the butt end. <laughs> You're no printer. And I was thinking, yeah, but it's a nice show. So, <laughs> <laughs> so this was a. Uh, another attempt at full color, uh, realizing a full color print or a true color, uh, which uh, I'm still trying to communicate a, a broad color range. This one was 32 blocks, uh, and it's about eight inches. The image is about eight inches square, so it's very small and precious. Of uh, Sarah, one of my main models, and, and uh, her daughter Lily, my goddaughter, who's now 17 or so three long prints, all, again, I, I describe these all as Japanese uh, riffs on Japanese, like me talking uh, Japanese prints, beautiful women, uh, samurai, sumo and beachin, my brave friend Rod, his girlfriend of one week, what a date. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I'd been printing on Iwano Ichibe's paper, and I wanted to print even larger. I went to visit Iwano and uh, traded my prints for his paper and, and a lot of money besides. And his uh, certificate of his designation as a national treasure behind him. Cool guy. That was a very fun and uh, humbling trip. Here I am with April Vollmer. In, uh, at Union College for a show, and she's wearing my hat and I'm wearing my scarf. You can see the scale of the prints I showed earlier. Uh, a print of uh, uh, Madeline on the left was, was my studio assistant and her best friend Kit in the striped dress that I really liked at that time. Here we can see, let's see if I can play. I tried to cut the sound out of all of these. So uh, we won't be bothered in case the projector has sound, but there's a little squeak every time in the drawer. So, so I'm standing on the foot pedal. This print doesn't require the drawer, but it makes it easier for me to print using it. So I'm printing using this drawer and uh, stacking my paper, trying to equalize the moisture. I'm very impatient, uh, and uh, so I tend to print uh, until the paper really is too soft to print, but I'll keep going and start using uh, the newsprint backing sheet to avoid tearing up the paper and to soak up some of the moisture. And really, at this point, I should have been waiting until tomorrow to print, but I wanted to keep going. Anyway, you can see my uh, how I labor over each one. <laughs> uh, not, not really. I, I print as rapidly as I can. I'm adding moisture. You guys know this. Here I'm putting a little pigment on the brush, especially on this little print. It's more accurate that way. Okay. So uh, to work bigger, I'm not really in chronological order here, but you'll get that idea. Here I built a large press, about five by ten feet. Uh, in order to print up to four by eight foot sheets. You can see a print in the drawer. The press is a pitch roller press, and I built it in 
machine the parts on my CNC machine as if they were wood. And there was the third print off of, the, off of that press and there was in the gallery. That's the only, my only wood cut that uh, was purchased by a museum. And, and uh, so it's notable for that reason. Five minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes. <laughs> and uh, here I'm reducing a block. The white parts you can see are reduced. Here's, here are two of these. These prints are about one by two meters hanging up on the wall of the studio. Controlling the up and down motion of a V-shaped tool to make a spiral out of the cat's eye on a block and then the print which was from three blocks, one carved out of, with a spiral out of one eye, one carved with a spiral out of the other, and maybe it was two blocks. For Yuji, I don't think he's in here, but his print reminded me of this self-portrait that's about three inches high and made of little squares like this beautiful little square print. Here I'm uh, printing a two meter long by 20 inch uh, tall landscape, brushing water, upper left, brushing water, upper right, pigment, uh, lower left, registering paper out of my moving drawer and printing. So it's like, here. I'm hurrying, Claire. <laughs> <laughs> You can see the humidifier drawer coming out. So here, this is a, a month or so ago, uh, brushing up a block. Uh, it's an image of clovers. Again, going back to those first images of tiles and that all over kind of pattern. show this or not, but we'll do it anyway. So here you can see more in real time the use of this sliding paper humidor. The paper delivery is powered by garage door opener, which I thought was a fantastic solution to linear actuation, which is quite expensive and hard to control. So for $100 at the depot, I've got garage door opener. I've been thinking about how to do this for months. So I, I, you know, I need to get around the press. I have to have room between me and the drawer. So the drawer throws about seven feet, and uh, which is just about how far a garage door opener travels. I'm hitting the button for the garage door opener with my toe. And out comes the drawer. It opens kind of like a silk screen. It has a couple of a couple of little pieces of aluminum on each side that hold the drawer open for me. And I reach in to get the paper. I'm registering in a kind of a hybrid system, so I use notches like Canto on each side and then a center line. Each sheet of paper has a little pencil line in the center of it, so I slide back and forth to get the pencil line in the right spot. The paper is laid out. I pull the print. Uh, the the one by two meter prints were too challenging with a baran because you don't, with only a few sheets to print, you can't learn the block. So so the, ten, ten, the tendency is to fall off and smudge the print. So I really liked using the roller, and it makes a nice impression, just not as uh, variable as. Uh, <laughs>
talking about time and eternity. <laughs> <laughs> so if you uh, want to go to the toilet, this might last. <laughs> but anyway, now it's moving too fast. So should I edit? Uh, oh my God, it should not go yet there. So this is automatically changing. Probably I have to hurry. So can I get this? Uh, so I can go. You have a crown here, so could you please this is called, eh? speak up? You have a job. You have a lot of fans here, so if you could speak up. Uh, yeah, I will speak up, uh, but I'm just worried that this has a timer, so it changes quickly. It's okay, well, now just to the view then. It's, well, it's now it's steady. Okay, I, I continue quickly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to read from the paper, otherwise uh, my, my speech will be very long. Okay, I take my breath and then... <laughs> Time. What is time? Time has no absolute universal meaning. It is uh, just a human experience. Our concept of time is based on the cycle of day and night, changing seasons and other constantly moving chains of events. Time can be felt and measured only by change. Art is said to be a mirror of time. In art we see reflections of various moments that have captured the artist. Art can also carry important messages or preserve historical events for future generations. Sense of time is connected to our language processing part of the brain. It is influenced especially by the way we produce writing. In the West, time usually proceeds in a straight line from left to right, like a text in a book. In Japan, time rotates in a cycle or in many simultaneous cycles. Now, this is rotating too fast. <laughs> okay. uh, it can be compared to Japanese writing, which flows in many directions, from up to down and from left to right. Nowadays, also horizontally from left to right. Free direction in writing and the ambiguity in verbal expression leads to a conclusion that time has a multi-layered character in Japan. The moment called now incorporates simultaneously, simultaneously the past and future. Time can also slow down or vanish completely, like in tea ceremony, or it can be highly pointed and accurate, like the arrival of a train, perfectly in time. There are also other cultural aspects to the matter. Uh, in Japan, years are counted and marked by uh, two ways, in Western standards and with Emperor's era. Moreover, the annual festivals add unique structure to Japanese general sense of time. Japanese people see themselves in, relation, uh, in relationship to others and to surrounding events. Things join together, nothing is separate from larger whole. In conversation, the consideration of others is preferred to self-expression and straight opinions. This worldview is visible in traditional bird-eye composition. Wait. Uh, <laughs> 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 robots are not friends with me. Um, things, uh, things are observed objectively from outsider's point of view. Uh, while being aware uh, of the many dimensions of, uh, in time, uh, we are able to concentrate in only one single moment at a time. Uh, th thus, the concept of time is connected deeply into counting. We count minutes, hours, days and years. Putting them into order gives us a structure of time. So, please <laughs> In his print, uh, Shape of Time, Yamanaka again shows three types of time. In the middle are the spotlight short moments. On the left, there is a darker, tight flow of time. On the right, we see a sprout coming out from the flow. It can be uh, thought as a symbol of artist's uh, personal growth. <coughs> Age influences greatly to the sense of time. Fourteen years later, Yamanaka made another print uh, with time as a motif. Here the moments in the middle look like small stars in the sky. The composition has changed from vertical to horizontal. <coughs> the flow and growth upwards, which we saw in his earlier print, has ended. <coughs> With 
age, uh, the artist feels his world is expanding wider. The multi-layered concept of time is visible also in older Japanese prints. Here on the left we have Sadafusa's print implying the changing seasons in Edo. On the upper right corner we see a komae, a small picture window, often used in ukiyo-e to add separate time and space dimension. In this komae we have uh, cherry trees in spring. <coughs> Under them we uh, find red maple leaves symboling autumn. On the left side of the print there is a branch of nemo tree which blooms in the summer. We see komae also in Ishihakute's print on the right. Here it shows the nighttime of modern age in uh, Tokyo. There is an electricity pole in the center and the houses are brightly lit. What remains unchanged in time is the beautiful woman in kimono. It was a common motif uh, to aki ukiyo-e artists throughout the ages. Here we see one more print implying multi-layer time. Past and present is included in Yamaguchi uh, Akira's print of Tokyo Nihonbashi. The bridge is depicted as it was in three different periods of time. The upper bridge is the one we see in famous Hiroshige's Tokaido print series. The lowest bridge is the stone bridge from, uh, from the beginning of 20th century. And in the middle we find the contemporary highway crossing the area. Japanese time is not only multi-layered, it also goes around in endless cycle. The time, life and death belong to the same continuance. There is also a certain melancholy in Japanese sense of time. Things happen. Life is a dream-like illusion. Jinsei wa bonjiyo de ari. Sense of cyclic time is based on the ever-rotating four seasons. In Japanese art and culture, especially spring and autumn, are the most loved and most often visualized times of the year. In ukiyo prints, you can find signs of seasons hidden in kimono patterns along with uh, changing fashions. Another important visual element is the moon and its various shapes. Here we have Hiroshige's print of Shinano, which is a famous place for viewing the full moon. If you look carefully, you can find how the moon multiplies on the surface of the water in rice paddies. We find a moon repeating itself also in Hasekawa Yuichi's print uh, titled The Passage of Time. Although the composition is not a circle, we can feel the cycle of time in the rising shapes of the full moon. Along with the monthly moon cycle, we experience time in repetition of light and darkness. In other words, the repetition of day and night. Here, printmaker Akimana has visualized a cycle of days in black lines. The small white scratches on the background give interesting vibrancy to the monochrome image. Things happen. Uh, everything is connected. In Japan, from 14th century until Meiji period, one day was divided in 12 two-hour sections. These hours were called koku. They were named according to the 12 zodiac animals in Chinese uh, astrology. Utamaro Seiro Junitoki is a print series showing, uh, let's go back as well, showing uh, the life in geisha quarters around the 12 koku hour clock. Here we see the dragon's hour in the morning when the women get to rest after the long night's work. The time element is stressed cleverly in the title strip on the right. It is designed to a shape of a pendulum clock. Contemporary international Tokyo time started in Japan 1877. This gave inspiration to Ukiyo artist Toyohara Kunichika, who made a series of women's life in modern cities. This print shows a midnight scene at 1 a.m. Koma e on the left corner is shaped as a pocket watch. Uh, in it, oh, in it, <laughs> there is a kabuki brochure. It reveals where the woman was earlier in the evening. 
there is also a western tall case uh, clock in the picture, which points out the wealth of the house. Days and months have to be put in good order to form a well-functioning society. For this, a variety of calendars were created in Japan. They were based on the cycle of the moon until the beginning of the 19th century. Calendars in Edo period were not as accurate as the calendars of today. They usually showed only how the long, uh, how the long and short months were arranged in each. Calendars usually have symbols of good luck and fortune in them. The calendar part is the black part there. You can see uh, on the right. There is the, the long months, and on the left there are the short ones. Calendar bricks were in key role in a development of Mokuhanga technique. The very first Nishiki e print is known to be a calendar by Suzuki Harunoku. He designed it in 1765 for, for a wealthy poem, poet, Okubo Kyosen. Privately commissioned Egoyomi calendars were playfully designed uh, as picture puzzles. Here we see how the order of long and short months of the year are shown as big and small sake cups flying from the hand of Daikoku, one of the seven uh, cards, seven lucky cards. Uh, some calendar prints carry personal advice and divinations for people. In human life there are good times and bad times and predicting them helps a lot. This uke e <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, this uke e woodblock print shows the year uh, shows the years when a person moves to a favorable uke period in his or her life. The picture is designed to be a lucky <coughs> charm. It has objects and characters that begin with the syllable fu, indicating the word fuku meaning happiness. These periods go uh, in a cycle of five and seven years. So there are five, after five bad years come seven happy years. So luckily we have longer than, longer luck than. <coughs> okay, now we go to um, eternity. Uh, time is relatively easy thing to visualize in comparison to attempt to give form to eternity. We can try to stop the movement of time with a dot located in the center of square uh, or trial and symmetrical composition also transmit a sense of immovability. Hmm. And therefore they are often used as base of for religious art. Mandana carries these basic visual elements of timelessness. When meditating in front of mandala, you find some uh, eternal dimension in your mind. <laughs> Japan is a country with unstable natural environment. Earthquakes, uh, tsunami, typhoon, and uh, heavy rain, landslides, not to mention the active volcanoes, they all have affected on the minds of people. Life is uncertain. It can vanish in a blink of an eye. In such an environment, permanence is a relative concept. Mundane world is, a constant, is in constant change. Eternity belongs to the realms of gods and to the afterwards. In the midst of impermanency, there is one thing that feels flawless and steady. It is the Fuji Mountain. Seeing Fuji Mountain uh, relaxes Japanese people. You can see it often on the walls of public bathhouses. The triangle shape of the mountain is easily recognizable, as you see in this simple print by Nakata. Uh, the steadiness of the sacred mountain gives firm contrast to variable weather conditions around it. Fuji Mountain has been an inspiration to many printmakers in Japan throughout the ages. In Watanabe's print, Fuji has a shining aura around it, making the mountain magically <coughs> self-luminous. <coughs> In a uh, famous Hokusai's print, uh, the sea represents the ever-changing world around us. The shape of Fuji in the horizon gives permanency to it. It is a sacred place we can always rely on. Hokusai's <coughs> print be becomes alive in a new form in Kawachi Seiko's print. 
Here the Fuji mountain is inserted uh, in a small picture window in the background. Bridge has a certain poetical meaning for Japanese people. Bridge is symmetrical, like life and death at extreme ends. On bridge you are between places in an intermediate space and time called Ma. It is a place where ghosts and gods may appear. <coughs> in old ukiyo-e or about bridges, uh, we often see fireworks on the sky. They symbolize the shortness and beauty of life. <coughs> Fireworks also bring in mind the Obon time in August, when the deceased relatives come to visit the living. This annual meeting with the dead creates a time cycle and makes a bridge from this world to the afterworld. In religious ceremonies and in prayers, repetition is a key element. Repeating is a meditative act which purifies the mind and gives permanence to the object being repeated. This idea works well also with non-religious printmaking. For example, re-carving and reprinting the ukiyo-e masterpieces <coughs> is appreciated as an act of keeping the valued Mokuhanga craftsmanship alive for centuries. In, in Japan, uh, the first large-scale uh, commission for religious prints is Yakubando Darani which was completed in year 770. One million small wooden pagodas were carved and a slip of Buddhist sutra print was inserted in each of them. Stamping was the early method of copying religious figures. Uh, the images were stamped one by one in prayer books and diaries. Later in 14th century, stamping was replaced by printing from carved wood blocks which enabled to produce many Buddha figures on paper with just one rabbi. The history of Japanese woodblock prints starts with religious prints. Small size figure prints were popular as protective, pro, protective, not protective, protective amulets. The printing blocks, oops, too fast. <laughs> trying to keep up with the <laughs> conference now. Okay, the printing blocks for the amulets were all often old and badly worn out, <coughs> so the lines in the print were shabby. That did not bother the pilgrims as long as the image was somehow recognizable. In early days uh, of Buddhism, Buddha was never shown in human figure. His presence was expressed by painting or carving only his wood footprints. In Yamada Kyoharu's print, we see Buseki, Buddha's stone footprints, on which flowers of Shala have fallen. Shala flower opens in the morning and falls on the ground in the evening. It is a symbol of impermanence and rapid passing of glory and life. Uh, okay. Along with Buddhist pantheon, there is a myriad of Shinto gods and goddesses in Japan. They prevail uh, everywhere in nature, in trees, mountains, rivers, and stones. Gods reside also in changing elements like fire, rain, and storm. <coughs> Here we see the thunder god by Shiominana. The appearance of the god follows the traditional way of depicting him, but the space where he flies is an empty room space, a trademark of Shiomi. There is also a great variety of spirits, ghosts, and demons in Japan. Printmaker uh, Ishita Yoshikazu is especially fond of only demons. Here is uh, one example of his series of oni faces. As you can see there, there are many oni uh, figures inside the face, so uh, in the time is uh, multi-layered. <coughs> Uh, death is a mystery that keeps fascinating people. There is an interesting woodblock print genre in Japan called Shinie, Memorial Death Prints. They were produced for sale uh, when a famous person died. In this print we see actor Ichikawa Danjuro 8 uh, reflected in a mirror. In front of him is another deceased <coughs> actor holding Danjuro's kaimyo, new name to be used in the afterworld. 
after world. What happens when a person dies? It is widely believed that human being has an eternal soul that separates from the body in death. In Japan, the shape of the soul is thought to be a shining light bulb or a burning flame. In Fujimori Shizuo's print, the death squeezes the peacefully floating man with black hands. The round shining shape behind him seems to be his departed soul. The raised hand signifies a silent uh, surrender. In this large print by Kawabata Chie, we see a tree, symbol of life and growth. It is surrounded with flying light balls. They are the souls of people returning to the earth from the afterworld. The cycle of time and energy is eternal. Thank you for your time. <laughs>
for a customer one only, and when it, the time itself is burned down, so the time is out. And uh, there are many interesting clocks also, how to measure time. But my interest was how to visualize it, so how people take it, uh, how artists uh, deal with the problem, and how they show. And the uh, changing of seasons is really the really, really important element in all Japanese art and culture, so uh, that is uh, showing their sensibility towards <coughs> nature also. And I'm interested in this now moment, which is having past and future at the same time. So it's not here and there, so it's here. <coughs> so <laughs> it's hard to uh, understand. Or like, have to be, and you have to become empty to get that. So it becomes uh, somehow you have to take everything away from your mind, and then you catch the past, the present, and the uh, future at the same moment. Thank you.